All right, so this morning we are shifting gears after wrapping up a most epic, epic series in the book of Colossians. Who was blessed by that? Man, that book is off the chart. It's like Paul was writing it to me and say, this is how you survive in America in the year 2015. Yep, right here in America. So we're shifting gears because who knows what's going to happen on August 16th right here at Grafted Church. Baptism. Baptism, woo! Yep, I am excited about that. So we are going to launch, I guess you could call it a series, but we're going to do a little study and we're going to talk about baptism and several aspects of baptism. So we all know baptism. When you, when you think about baptism and you, you associate baptism, how many think of John the Baptist or John the Baptizer, right? Yeah. Because I know the Methodists go, why does he got, why does he got to be Baptist? All right, so John the Baptizer. Okay, so we we think of we think of bap, of baptism in a New Testament context, and we usually typically associate it with Jesus. But and we're going to get there, I promise. We're we're going to get there. However, we're going to go back and we're going to start. I mean, we're going to go back. We are taking it back old school. We're going to go back to some of the origin, talking about baptism. Who has ever heard the word mikvah? All right, the two folks that study Hebrew. <laughs> mikvah. Okay, so a mikvah, when we look at a mikvah, that's a picture of a mikvah, of a real old mikvah. Okay? A mikvah is a ceremonial bath, and it's built to very specific standards and size. It has to hold at least 120 gallons of water so that uh, somebody of my stature, at least, could be fully submersed. <laughs> okay? It is a ritual bath. And when you read through the New Testament, a lot of times, so mikvah is a Hebrew word, and it's actually a derivative from the word, I think, I don't know how to say it correctly, quava, Q Q A V A H, quava. And what it means is it means to gather the waters. That's, that's, that's like, Literally what it, what it means. If you use it in a verb form, it means literally to gather the water. So when we see it in the New Testament, for those of us who explode that thing and look at the Greek, we see the Greek word, baptismal. And that's where we get baptismal. That's where we get baptistry and all these other words that we made up and came up with, right? So when you read that in the New Testament, a lot of times what we see is, is we see it in context with the Pharisees Okay, charging money, like an admission fee, for regular folk like us to come into the baptismo or into the mikvah to be washed just before we could even step foot on holy ground, i.e. the temple. All right, so it was a nice little, it was, it was you know, what we call in the, in the hood in California, you know, where I grew up in the hood, that's what we call a hustle. Okay, a hustle. These dudes were making money hand over fist charging people to be clean to come into the temple. But this is what I'm going to have you do. I'm going to have you go to the book of Genesis. We're going to go to chapter, actually chapter 1. I know, I'm sorry, Sound Booth, I changed it again. We will go to 2, I promise. But we're going to go to chapter 1 and actually go to verse 10. This is actually where we see the, the word mikvah used for the very first time in Scripture. And it's very simple. It's chapter 1. Verse 10, God called the dry land earth, and the waters that were gathered together, he called seas, and God saw that it was good. That word, waters gathered together, that phrase, when you look at it in just straight up Hebrew, is replaced with the word mikvah. Mikvah, the gathering of the waters. Kind of cool, huh? Now we could now listen. Now what I could say right now is turn to the entire book of Leviticus, and we'll go through the whole book of Leviticus. But that isn't going to work. I got to catch a flight this afternoon, right? So, so that ain't going to fly. However, we could look all through Levitical law, and we could see all of the requirements that 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 are um, that there are in sustaining a mikvah. So a mikvah can't be just a standing body of water. It has to be a flowing 
body of water. It has to be fed by a flowing body of water, right? It can't be treated with chemicals or additives or even essential oils or anything like that. It's got to be fresh water. It's got to come flowing through. It's got to be flowing out. It has to be a living water, a, a water worthy of sustaining life. It has to go in. It has to be able to go out. It's got to be 120 gallons. It's got to be so many cubits by so many cubits, and you've got to be able to submerse a big body like mine. So that would be a mikvah, but when we look at mikvah in this context, it is a gathering and bringing together. Now, what's really going to blow your mind is this. As you know, this is what I love about Hebrew, because Hebrew, right, you, like the word for, for the word for music stand could mean music stand, but it could also mean like run real fast. Okay. Yeah, that's like, like Hebrew is like, yeah, it's, it's, it's really cool like that. So there's interchangeable stuff that we use uh, in, in Hebrew and that when we look at this word mikvah, if you were to look at an actual Hebrew scripture and see other occurrences of it and then look at the translation, again, back over to English, the second most used context for the word mikvah is hope. Hope. That's gangster, isn't it? Hope. The next most commonly used term or context means to abide. To abide. The gathering of waters, of living, flowing waters, giving hope or abiding. Now, that doesn't surprise me when we talk about, we were looking in uh, Genesis chapter 1, we're talking about the, the account of creation. God creates, right? He speaks stuff. He forms stuff. Stuff comes into existence and comes to be. That does not surprise me that all of what he creates abides in what he says. He gathered the water together. He mikvahed that junk. That's what I'm talking about. And the water abided. Right? With hope that there would be that when it did, that there would be dry land. And you go, okay. What has this got to do with baptism? We're getting there. So I, I pulled up some of the stuff when we look at mikvah, right? So mikvah, uh, me and Teddy were talking about this yesterday, and she's like, she's like, okay, the actual mikvah is the actual act of washing, and I'm like, well, kind of the mikvah is the actual tub or thing, that's the right. But it, the, but there's like the noun and there's the verb, and remember, I'm no good at grammar, and the adverb and all this stuff. It's just like if we say bath. Okay, you get in the bath. Oh, it's a bathtub, but what do we call it? We call it a bath. What do we do? We take a bath. We bathe there, right? So, you know, it's just like, like, well, well, well what is this? This is a phone, but what do you do? You can phone somebody. Does that mean that you bludgeon somebody to death with this device? <laughs> I'm phoning you rapidly, right? No. So, so when we look at mikvah, mikvah, that, that word gets, gets interchanged for being just for being the noun and for being the verb. So it's common when you, when you watch documentaries and stuff about Hasidic Jews and everything, they talk about, yeah, man, dude, he got mikvahed. It's like, like with the bath, like, yeah, he was mikvahed in what? In a mikvah. Like you took a bath in the bath. That's okay. So, all right. So I don't want you guys to get confused because... We could go, go through all the book of Leviticus and all the book of Deuteronomy and, and Exodus, and we could see all these different Hebrew words and terms for washing. But mikvah is this kind of specific type of washing. Now, I just pulled up some examples that we could look all through uh, Scripture and go, when, do, when is it required that we be mikvah under the Old Testament, right? Going back old school. So, when we have certain skin conditions, leprosy, psoriasis. What, toe jam, whatever, right? We got different skin conditions. Okay, when you came into contact, you had to be mikvah with a certain skin conditions. If you come into contact with somebody who's sick or diseased or somebody who's dying, after the fact, you're considered unclean. So you have to be mikvah. You got to be mikvah. Jewish priests, when they're being consecrated into service, 
they got to be mikvah. The high priest, when he would go into the Holy of Holies, mikvah. Oh, yeah. Um, what was the other one? I meant to print out my notes this morning and failed to do so. So it looks like I'm just checking Facebook. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, this is the other thing. Eating meat from an animal that died naturally. So that we don't know if that animal, was, if, it's, if its life was taken in a kosher fashion according to the rabbinic law. Right? So you're not sure. You're like, well, was he just old? Did he have a disease? Like, what's it like? We're not really sure. You know, but sometimes, you know, I mean, take it from a man who's almost 300 pounds, sometimes the brother's just got to eat. And when we do, we go, well, what's the origin of the animal? Well, we don't know. Well, if we're going to take part in this and we're going to partake of this, man, what we got to do is we're now ceremonially unclean. We got to have to be mikvah. Um, a bride before a wedding. Conversion to Judaism. You got to wash off whatever the world had on you. Come into service of the Lord. Okay? And then Teddy told me not to say it, so I'm not going to use the word. But for all women who are of age, once a month, mikvah. Okay? Mikvah. And then, it's a, then the term gets interchanged, but you know, later on, when we get into to December and we start talking about the, the coming of our, our Savior, we, and we see about even Jesus' dedication in the temple had to come for a period of time after Jesus was born that his mother, Mary, had to go through the ceremonial cleansing. Now, there's, like I say, there's other terms, and we could get into all of that, but just if we just generalize it, after women, after you give birth, you're ceremonially unclean. you got to mikvah. Now, so we have all these different examples of what mikvah is. Now, here's the other thing. Now, if we go back and we look again in Leviticus, like I say, we could read through the whole book of Leviticus today, right? But we're not going to do that. So, you're going to have to click the I Believe button and actually open the Scripture and look at it for yourself. And notice that when God was establishing His Levitical law, all 613 laws, okay, we had where the nation of Israel comes out of Egypt, comes out of corruption, comes out of slavery, comes out of bondage, comes out of whatever you want to call it, and they go into the desert. God is setting them apart. They're their own race of people. They have their own language. They have their own traditions. <laughs> they have the most beast mode God in all of eternity. <clears throat> right? <laughs> but there's also something a little bit different about them that we look in comparison to that, you know, dictated by the law, that we look in comparison to the nations that are around them. Is the Jews, these Hebrew folk out here in the desert, if you've ever been to the desert and know how dirty everything can get, you get sand in places you didn't think you could get sand, you would get dirty, right? These are particularly clean people and healthy people. Yeah, yeah, I know. You know, we, we think about the law sometimes when we read through stuff and we go, well, that, that seems silly. You don't, you, don't have, you don't take a piece of cheese and you can't put it with this piece of meat and this kind of bread and you go, well, I don't... I don't understand that. Well, you don't have to. You just click the I believe button. I believe God. He knows better than me. But there's some stuff that, that when you look at it actually makes sense. Okay? Now, right here in this moment right here, I am praising God for physicians. Because if we were under the old covenant right now, if somebody had a sore or some kind of gaping wound or something that looked like an infection, a ringworm or just whatever says that itches, according to Levitical law, you have to bring that to the priest for him to inspect. Yeah. So it's like, man, okay, you got this issue. I'm the pastor. I, I got to take a look. Oh, yeah, that looks, I don't know what. But then what happens? The priest says, you got to go out of the camp. You got to go out of the camp for a period of time, right? For a period of time. And when you go out of the camp for a period of time, what you have to do is you have to go close to a living water source, a running water source, a stream, a lake a creek, a natural spring, something like that, a natural water source. And then it's very specific about you go upstream to get the water that you drink from, then you must go downstream from that, and you must mikvah. You must bathe. Wash that stuff off. And, right? Now here's the other thing. 
Do not do just a general YouTube search for mikvah. Okay? <laughs> do not do that. Because a lot of the videos will come up and say, this video has been flagged for something, click, I agree that I'm 18 years old. Because I found out this, that mikvah, you're stark naked. Birthday suit. Praise the Lord. So Levitical law says you got to go, you got to get the water from this part of the stream, you got to move downstream, and then you got to mikvah, and then you got to move downstream, and that's where if you got to dump any waste and stuff like that, you get rid of that stuff. Now, when we look at that in our modern society, you know what we call that? Good hygiene. And you would think, for, you know, for us, we go, oh, that, that's common sense. Yeah, that's sanitation, right? That's sanitary. But the Egyptians didn't know that. And the Chaldeans didn't know that. And the Canaanites didn't know that, right? And the Moabites didn't know that. And they didn't have this. And what we see is, man, we see this degradation of those cultures and those societies. However, God puts in place for us law that if we abide, keeps us healthy and keeps us safe. Now, after eight days or seven days or however many days it is, whatever else, you get dressed, then you come back to see the priest. And he's got to look at it again and go, hey, man, it looks like it's clearing up. You can come back into the camp. Or, uh, no, that's still oozing. Please leave. All right? So when we look at it, 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 it makes perfect sense. Now, you know what's another funny thing that we mikvah, that you should mikvah? That Jews, like if you bring, if you know a, a good, like hardcore Hasidic Jewish family, and you want to bring them gifts, you know, like, hey man, I got this cool tea set or whatever I want to bring you. They say anything that they would use in the kitchen that they receive from a Gentile, mikvah. And we go, man, that seems, seems so crazy. Okay, with the exception of dudes in here who go shopping. When you go shopping and you buy clothes, what's the first thing you do? Take them home and what? All right. If you're a dude, you usually just leave the old shirt in the dressing room and take the tag and say, and just, just ring me up, right? Because <laughs> dudes don't care. And then we wonder why, you know, man, it's itching. This shirt, new shirt's itching. <laughs> I don't know why. All right? So your utensils, your clothing, all this stuff, man, got to be mikvahed before it can come into the camp, come into your house. It's got to be washed off. And you go, oh, that's, that's kind of interesting. But what I don't want you guys to misunderstand is this, is that when we mikvah or we wash or we're fully submersed, is that that doesn't clear up our condition. That does not clear up our condition. There's no sense, well, I'm not saying there's no sense, but to go, well, it looks like I have an open wound and I have an infection here. Not being healed of that infection and then trying to go and just wash it and wash it and wash it and wash it. It'll be cleaned up for that moment or maybe for the next couple days. But that thing is not healed. That's not, it's not healed. Not at all. All right? You're going to require some kind of intervention, outside intervention for that wound that you've incurred. You may require surgery, may require antibiotics, may require some other kind of treatment, whatever the case is. However, if we receive the treatment, yet we don't wash or keep it clean, then how effective is your treatment? Oh. So, what I don't want you to misunderstand is to think that our mikvah, or our washing, or our baptismo is going to be the thing that just cleans us up and keeps us clean and completely heals us. There's a step that comes before that. And we call that atonement. Atonement. Hmm. See, if somebody prescribes you the antibiotics, but you don't take them, you can wash and wash and wash and wash. Right? Somebody prescribes you the antibiotics, and you do take them, but you never wash off that thing that's killing you? So I don't want you guys to be misunderstood or misled that 
baptism automatically equals salvation. No, no, no. No, no, no. Baptism comes as a result of salvation. Now go to Leviticus chapter 16. And you're going to go, whoa. For those of you well-versed in the scriptures, are going to go, oh, wait a second. Frank, that's not, this ain't mikvah. This is, what is, the, what is the heading in most of your Bible say? Day of Atonement. The Day of Atonement. We'll start in verse 1, and I'm going to skip through a lot of this. The Lord spoke to Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron. When they drew near before the Lord and died, and the Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron your brother not to come at any time into the holy place inside the veil before the mercy seat that is on the ark, so that he may not die, for I will appear in a cloud over the mercy seat. So we're, we'll pause right there, and what are we talking about? We're talking about being in the presence of the Lord. Hmm. In the presence of the Lord. But in this way, Aaron shall come into the holy place with a bull from the herd for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. And he shall put, put on the holy linen coat and shall have the linen undergarments on his body. And he shall tie the linen sash around his waist and wear the linen, linen turban. These are the holy garments. He shall bathe his body in water and then put them on. Bathe his body in water. That doesn't mean jump into a pond. That is the, that thing. That's, this is the mikvah. means he, he's got to be washed. He's got to be kind of overcome with like living water, with the fresh water. And he's got to be clean before he can step into the presence of the Lord. You go, man, what a tough, like, what if I didn't wash good enough, you know? What if, what if I still got that smudge on my forehead? When you're bald, you get those a lot, right? It's not, it's not, it's not, you know, it's not, hey, man, we're in, you know, we're in the desert in, you know, in, in like the year zero here. There's no mirrors. You just, you just rely on your, hey, bro, what up, I got something right here? Yeah, you got something right here. All right. So he's got he's to bathe before going in to the Holy of Holies. This is a mikvah. Verse 5. And he shall take from the congregation of the people of Israel two male goats for a sin offering and one ram for burnt offering. Aaron shall offer the bull as a sin offering for himself and shall make atonement for himself and for his house. Then he shall take the two goats and set them before the Lord at the entrance of the tent of meeting. And Aaron shall cast lots over the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other lot for his azel. And Aaron shall present the goat on which the lot fell for the Lord and use it as a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot fell for Azazel shall be pre- presented alive before the Lord to make atonement over it, that it may be sent away into the wilderness to Azazel. So what I really want to say right here is Jesus, 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 Jesus. That's really what I want to say. Because what do we have? We have representation of Jesus as the priest, number one. Holy, clean, squared away, got on the priestly garments, can stand firmly, proudly, confidently in the presence of God. We got Jesus. And then what do we got? We got the bull for the sin offering. And what, do we, and what does that represent? Jesus. Then we have the goat. And in our modern terms, or we translate that Hebrew word, it comes out to the word what? Scapegoat. The one that all the sin... And all the curses and all the buh is cast on and sent away out to certain death. It's sent away out to certain death. That represents Jesus. Now, last year when we did the study on the Day of Atonement, and I don't want to just, I don't want to beat up the Day of Atonement, but, you know, when you watch on the news and you watch when the Day of Atonement comes and all these big ceremonies around Israel, Right, the, the Jews that, that, that still practice this and look at this, when you see that goat come out, right, because you're talking about huge, huge crowds of people gathering for this thing, right, that 
don't believe that Jesus is the Messiah and they're still waiting on the Messiah and they still believe that a priest, that an earthly priest can atone for their sins. And it's huge. When the, when the priest that comes out, and he's usually got kind of a long rope or something, he kind of stands off away from the scapegoat. When he comes walking through, man, that crowd splits. And you know what the people do? Is they curse the goat as it goes by. And they hurl insults at it. And they spit at it. And they throw stuff. And everything. Does that remind you of anybody? Oh, yeah. yeah. Our Lord, our Savior, our God, our King, walking through the streets of Jerusalem, bearing his cross, and the people hurling their insults and spitting at him and casting their curses and sin on him. And he chose to bear that. Man, another sermon. Don't I'm, I'm well, the God's gonna wreck me. That's the atonement that has to be made. Now, we could go on and we can, we can move on. Now, now we, we, you know what? Let's, let's keep clicking on here. Boop, 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 boop. Let's get all the way to verse 20. And when he has made an end of atonement for the holy place and the tent of meeting at the altar, he shall present the live goat, and Aaron shall lay both his hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it all the iniquities of the people of Israel and all their transgressions and their sins, and he shall put them on the head of the goat and send it away into the wilderness by the land of a man who is in readiness. So there's a priest like specifically designated for this duty, right? And when I mean duty, I mean like duty. It's bad, right? The goat shall bear all of their iniquities on itself to a remote area, and he shall let the goat go free in the wilderness. Now, what's really kind of funny about this is we got scripture and then we got tradition, okay? This is just like, this is like, um, like when the priest would go into the Holy of Holies, right? He, you saw that he's got a mikvah, and he's got to make atonement and everything, and it's all got to be spot on, right? The, 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 you know, his ephod, everything, he's got to be, I mean, he's got to be looking sharp before the Lord. Because if not, he goes in the Holy of Holies, and what happens? Yep, he dies. Who can go in and get him? The, the high priest next year. Okay, so that's a long time to be baking in the desert heat. Okay, so now, so then we have the tradition and the kind of the folklore of, now what do they do? They put a rope on the priest with a bell. <laughs> So when a bell stops ringing, they can stand outside a tent and pull him out. Okay, now here's the deal. This is probably, well, probably the first priest. This is what I would imagine the first priest doing the, doing the, the Azazel, the scapegoat. is like, okay, tell him, okay, your job is to walk this goat so far out into the desert that there's no resources and he will not come back. That's the biggest thing. We don't want this thing coming back. We don't want all that curse and sin and everything for the year. We don't want this junk back in our lives. So you've got to walk him so far out that even if he tries to come back, he'll die on the way. Yeah. So what does that priest got to do? He's got to walk him out there. Okay. And he's got to let him go. You think that guy ever made it back? No. Dang it. <laughs> <laughs> Dang it. If it goes so far out that the goat's going to die, guess who else is going to die and not make it back? Yeah. Yeah. So now, traditionally, what they do is they walk the goat to a cliff. Yeah. And he, the wilderness is down there, buddy. Yeah. Down he goes. Yeah, so, all right? So understand, understand that the atonement has to be made. And the atonement has to be made by the high priest who is the only one clean enough to go into the presence of the Lord before we can take our iniquities and our sin and our stuff into the presence of God. Period. So now, let's move all the way down. Verse 24, and he shall, okay, so actually verse 23, then Aaron shall come into the tent of meeting and shall take off the linen garments that he put on when he went into the holy place and he shall leave them there. And then he shall bathe his body in water or mikvah in a holy place and put on his garments and come out and offer burnt offerings and the burnt offering of the people to make atonement for himself and for the people and the fat of the sin offering shall be uh, shall burn on the altar and he who lets the goat go to Azazel shall wa if he makes it back shall wash his clothes and bathe his body in water which is mikvah and afterward he may come into the camp so he can be in the presence of the people he can be in the presence of God but he's got to be mikvah now remember you know, this priest who's, who's, on, who's on the scapegoat duty, 
Right? All he, what he's got to do is he's got to trust that the high priest back there is atoning for his sin. Because if his sin is never atoned for, he can let the thing go. Come back, man, I'm barely making it. I am barely making it. The goat ain't coming back, but I barely made it. Yeah, bad news, bro, you can't come back. You cannot come into the camp. You cannot come into the presence of the Lord because your high priest, the bell stopped ringing in the tent. We forgot to tie the rope on him. Right? The atonement has to be made. It doesn't matter. The priest who takes a scapegoat out, he can come back and he can mikvah all day, every day, ten times a day. If the atonement hasn't been made, he can't come back. That's kind of bad news or sad news. Now, let's look again. Mikvah, because after you walk that goat out into the desert, if you're the high priest and you are killing these animals and flinging the blood seven times on the altar in the mercy seat, and you're consumed by the, by the smoke and the fire of God, and when you're, when you're all done making the atonement, you know, you're, 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 you're ceremonially unclean. All right? Whenever you are dirty like that, what's the first thing you're looking forward to? A bath, baby, a shower. I want that hot water, man. I want that running water. Okay? And I don't want the water coming out of the spout smelling like I smell right now. Clean, living, sustainable, running water. Because I know that as soon as that's done, I can go back into the camp. I can be with my people. I can be in the presence of my God. That whole trek from the desert, you're walking back, and all you're doing is going, mikvah, mikvah, bath time, mikvah. I'm going to be clean because I have hope. Because I have hope. But that, because I got the mikvah, I got the bath, I got the water, I got the hope, I got, I'm abiding, I got everything that mikvah could entail and everything mikvah could mean, that's what I got. Baby, I got hope. Praise God. Now, let's move forward a few thousand years. When we turn our lives over to the Lord, I, I'll never forget that day that I laid my life down and said, God, this is all you because I cannot. When we do that, the thing is, we're cashing in on the atonement that's already been made. Period. Period. That happened at the cross 2,000 years ago. It was a done deal. Whatever's ailing me is now healed. What I got to do was head to the baptismo or to the mikvah and clearly let God say, Son, Wash off what's been killing you. Go down one way and come up another way. That was, I mean, no wonder we celebrate when we do baptisms. And we seal the deal. We're walking in. I was so nervous. I remember I was so nervous going, going to be baptized. But at the same time, I was so excited. Because it wasn't just like a, it wasn't just a, a thing of going, okay, Lord, it's just me and you right here. And, and I'm choosing to follow you, and this is, and I'm just laying it down, and this, that, and the other. And, and, I, and it's, you know, this is, a, this is a vertical relationship, and, you know, nobody else knows what's going on in my heart and everything. But it was that moment that I could look up and say, now I get to claim this to the entire world. And there'll be no doubt in anybody's mind that I come up changed changed mikvah gathering of hope jonah when we talked about when we went through the book of jonah we saw that jonah went into the whale one way he came out of that whale a different way and it was so radical and it was so awesome it made such an impression on jonah when he wrote down the book or whoever was with him that wrote down the book whoever it was i don't care they wrote it down, and it was so legit, and it was so awesome that even Jesus came back and said, guess what? I go down into the grave one way, just like Jonah, guys. And three days later, I'm coming back like a boss. Man, that's our king. 
That's our Savior. That's our God right there, boy. Ooh, hallelujah is right. Hallelujah is right. Genesis 2.21, don't, don't even turn there. Don't even turn there. Okay? Don't even turn there. I'm just going to tell you about it. This is in the Garden of Eden. Man and woman had sinned. God comes down and he says, hey, well, now let me give you an update. Let me tell you what's going to happen. Because, he, right, God, God didn't curse the ground. He said, because of what you did, now your sin cursed the ground. Right? That, that mess is in the dirt. That's how powerful, right? It's it cursed the ground. Now childbirth is going to be heinous. And now work is going to be laborious. And he goes on, he talks about the whole list and everything else of all that's, that's going to happen. And I'm looking at it and I'm like, man, at any moment, you know, when you read through it for the first time, at any moment you should go, you, you're just waiting. You're waiting for the story to come to an end because you're waiting for lightning bolts to come down and strike Adam and Eve dead. However, what, is, what does God do? 2.21, it says, and then the Lord made animal skin coverings for them. Because they had sewed together fig leaves and stuff that's going to leave you all itchy and brash-like. He made some legit animal skins. Where'd those come from? Yeah. So that means that we sinned and something died. Something that had no fault. Something that had no part in what we did had to give up its life. Somewhat willingly. So, God made a covering for us. That was like, we see the concept of sacrifice. We see the concept of atonement introduced right there in Genesis. Right in the very beginning. We see the plan of Jesus beginning to unfold. But you know what that did not do? Is that did not make us clean. That just kept us from certain death. And, and you go, oh, really, man? Didn't, you know, like Adam and Eve, like, didn't learn, and, and they didn't, like, have this big repenting moment, and, and they didn't go on and just be godly people and have a godly family and everything after the fact. They go out of the garden. They have two sons, Cain and Abel. And what happens? Yeah. Oof. So understand that atonement has to be made first. But in this case in Genesis, and then in the case of Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, all the way to Revelation, what do we see? We see that in Genesis, God made atonement for us. And then we see in all of the New Testament that God did what? Made atonement for us. We cannot atone for ourselves and our own stuff and our own sin. The action that we take is to cash in on that atonement and walk in that putting on a new identity by washing away the thing that was killing us before we were atoned. And that leads us to repentance and salvation, which we're going to get into in the coming weeks as we talk about this. But, um, but I put up here Jeremiah 17. I would like you to turn there. This is verse 13. Actually, we can go back to verse 12. Yeah, verse 12. A glorious throne set on high from the beginning is the place of your sanctuary. O Lord, the hope of Israel, all who forsake you shall be put to shame. Those who turn away from you shall be written in the earth. They have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living water. Who is Isaiah referring to? Jesus. O Lord, the hope of Israel. Guess what that word is in Hebrew? Mikvah. The gathering, the abiding, the washing, the cleansing, the ceremonial clean. That word, hope, was translated directly from the word mikvah. Then we go down to the bottom of that verse. 
the fountain of living water. Who said, I'll just give you one guess. His name starts with a J and ends with an S. Who said that he is the living water? Man. So if I had to just break this all down, right? Exactly. Yes. Okay. If I had to just break this all down, you know what this would tell me? Jesus, you sit on the throne and you are the hope and the living water. If I had to sum that up right then and there. When I, those weeks, those years leading up to that moment of me getting on my face before the Lord, I had it so backwards where I thought I had to be clean to be in the presence of the Lord before He would accept me. Instead of realizing I needed to be in the presence of the Lord before I could be clean. Because I had an identity crisis. Because I didn't know who I was, and I certainly didn't know who Jesus was. Because today I stand clinging to the hope and knowing that Jesus is the one who was clean before the Lord. And because of that atonement He made, I can come dirty and nasty, and God loves me all the same. And He is the one who makes me clean. Amen is right, man. That is... Man, we are in an evil age, church, but we are living some kingdom days right here. Holding on to the hope, to the mikvah, to the gathering, to the abiding of the Lord. That's what that is. Woo! Man, I'm going to... Brian and... Diana, you guys come back up, or Diana, or what? I don't care. Somebody get up here and play some music. Because we. You know, I look around and I look and I see believers. That's that's what I see, and I and. The days, of us living backwards and thinking that we got to be right before God, before He'll accept us, those, that, those days have got to come to an end. That's, that's just all there is to it. And here's the thing is, is we are leading this thing up to that day that we are gonna, we're, we're, we're going to have. There's going to be people here getting baptized right here probably in this very spot. Praise God. Praise God. People coming into the kingdom. And man, when you stand on the outside, that is such a, it seems like such a lofty idea. God seems so far away. And, and you know, we believe all of the, the trash and, and all of the rhetoric and all the stuff that, and, and stereotypes about church and about God and about Jesus and that he's mad at us and that we're not worthy and, and this, that. And, and ultimately God says, I desire steadfast love over requiring sacrifice. Because he took care of the sacrifice part for us. Coming into the kingdom, it's important that we be mikvah, inside, outside. That we be baptized. Is it essential? No. The, the, the actual ceremony of dunking the water, and you guys, you'll have clothes on, so. Is it absolutely required? No, it's not absolutely required. But man, that is a huge, huge profession to all of eternity and to all of mankind. That my day has come that I've been atoned for and I've repented and man, and I'm turning away from everything that's false and everything that's fake and man, and I am just going hard after Jesus. Period. And the cool thing about this is I'm going to let you guys in on something. I think Pastor Teddy is going to get baptized again. Coming up. Because even though we're already believers, we've already attached, you know, uh, taken hold of, of our atonement and that our salvation is already in place and that our repentance is the thing is, is that God renews us. Remember, he's that flowing new living water that sustains us with life all the time. And we go through seasons in life where sometimes we just got to stand up and we go, Lord, you got to burn off the chaff. I need to get rid of the thing that's killing me because you already fixed it. Let me cash in on that. So even as believers, if you're feeling like God's tugging on you, you're repenting for something, God's changing you, He's moving you, then don't be afraid. Get baptized again. 
Do it again, over and over and over. Profess it to the world. Man, if I got to get baptized every day so I'm walking around, my skin's all dried up and pruned up just so that somebody else can see how easy it is that we can go into the kingdom and how much God loves us into the kingdom, that's what I would do. So I'm going to have the worship team, they're going to play and just do a song. And, you know, just take this time, man. You guys can sit, you can lay down, you can stand up. It doesn't matter. You can be in here, out there in a parking lot, whatever, man. Just, just spend that time, just those moments with God and, and really, really ask God, man, God, is there anything in me that you need to burn off? Is there anything on me that you need to wash away? I promise wholeheartedly if we ask that we can pray with expectation. And God will show up. The Holy Spirit will do some work. Amen? So it's open. Altar's open. Back's open. Chairs are open. Spend that time.